Hi everybody, welcome to this book launch this evening um, and thank you for being here. It's cool to see that there are so many people here already. Um, of course, we're here to launch John F. Dean's new car collection, Naming of the Bones, which you can't actually see. <laughs> you have to trust me that I'm holding the right book up. Um, so it's really, really exciting um, that we're here tonight. We're joined by John. He's here, he's gonna read for us um, in a little while. <clears throat> uh, excuse me. And we're also joined by James Harper, um, who I'm going to hand over to in just a couple of minutes. Uh, but before I do that, I just want to run over what's going to happen tonight, um, run over some technical things with you and let you know what's going on. So um, tonight we'll be together for about one hour. Um, we'll, we'll be together until 8 p.m. Um, there are a lot of you here and it's very cool to see that some of you have already found the chat box. Um, we're really sorry that you can't turn your cameras on and we can't see your faces, so please do find the chat box. Um, let us know where you're watching from, what you think of the reading throughout, um, get the conversation going in that chat there, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, if you are using the chat, please make sure that you select the button for everyone before you send your message so that everyone at the event can see um, each other's messages and talk to each other. Um, now, while John is reading, I am going to have the text up on screen for you as a visual guide. Please do remember that you're in control of your own screen. So if something is too big or too small, just have a play around and see if you can make it fit your needs. Um, if you have any problems with any of the tech in the event, please pop it in the chat um, and I'll do my best to help you throughout the event. Um, now, uh, you have all paid to be here, so thank you so much. We appreciate it. Uh, there is, of course, a discount code. I did put it in the chat at the start of the event, but we'll we'll give you the discount code later on in the event as well, um, and we'll do all of that later on. So um, I think that's all the technical stuff out of the way. Um, oh, no, of course. Towards the end of the event, there's going to be time for uh, audience questions. James and John are going to have a bit of a preliminary chat themselves about the new book and about John's poetry. Again, we want you to be involved in that conversation as much as possible. So there is a different button as well as the chat button. It's called Q&A. If you guys get your questions lined up in there, then James can put them to John later on in the event. Um, and that'll be very, very cool. So um, I'm going to just give you a very brief introduction for James Harper. Um, I'm sure you've already come across his work. Um, he's written many, many collections of poetry, um, including with Anvil and subsequently Carcanet. Um, the latest Carcanet collection was The White Silhouette, which came out in 2018, and it's on our website. So um, if you don't know his work, you can go and buy it there. Um, he's also won many awards and many, many fellowships. Um, and he's worked with John for so many years that he's, he's the perfect person to have here. Um, so it's an absolute pleasure invite him on screen and ask him to switch his camera on and start the event with me. Oh, <laughs> there we go. Thanks, James. Am I live? Yep. Well, th thank you, um, Jasmine, for your kind introduction and good evening, everyone. Um, it's a huge pleasure to be uh, introducing uh, my friend and fellow poet John F. and celebrate his wonderful new book, Naming of the Bones. And a very warm welcome to all of you all over Ireland, uh, the UK and the rest of the world to this special event. I've been looking forward to it hugely and count myself lucky to have the best front row seat in the house, which just happens to be my own house as well. For those who may not know him as well as his many admirers and friends, I should say that John has done more for Irish poetry in the last 40 years than anyone I can think of. He founded Poetry Ireland, the nation's premier poetry organisation. He founded Poetry Ireland Review, the nation's premier poetry journal. He founded Dedalus Press, the nation's most dynamic poetry publisher. And you'd think after all that, he'd have the decency to lie back and watch his creations grow from the comfort of his Leitrim hammock. But for John, those foundations are really just a sideshow to the main business, which luckily for us has been honoring his muse. In conjunction with his muse, I'd like to quote something he said, which I think sums up his poetic approach pretty well. 
philosophy once said, it's an act of love and an act of will at the same time that turns me to the Hopkins task of getting down on my knees to sketch and make present the beauty and wonder of the small things. Like the superb loveliness of the Scarlet Pimpernel surviving on a path newly covered with tarmacadam. Of how a mouse-eared chickweed with its tiny and impossibly designed flower can flourish on the cement that holds a high brick wall together. In essence, that says it all. It says that John is in awe of creation and creation's creator. It says he's willing to confront the darkness of the world, the Tom Academy of life, and to express points of beauty in a beautiful way. He's also compared himself to someone, quote, laboring at the compost heap and hoping to see a shoot appear. All his poems are such shoots, reveling in the sheer delight of the haikiatas, or thisness of creation, to use a phrase of Gerard Manley Hopkins, one of John's spiritual mentors, alongside George Herbert and Thielard de Chardin and many others. John is in the first rank of contemporary European poets, a fact recognized by numerous awards given to him, not only in Ireland, but also in France, Serbia, and Italy. As a spiritual voice echoing over the plains, mountains, and bogs of his native country, he often seems to me to be like an Old Testament prophet, a voice crying in the wilderness, but with the softness and generosity of the vision of a Francis of Assisi or Hildegard of Bingen. At the heart of his poetry is the sense that the divine is always unfolding in the physical world as an echo of the incarnation. And at the heart of his physical world lies Ackel Island, the place where he was born, and which has become, thanks to his poetry, a state of being as much as a physical place, in the same way that Kabaki's Ithaca is a metaphysical ideal as much as an island. With this armory of spiritual seeking, erudition, life experience, wit, and intellectual curiosity, it would need a formidable verbal technique to bring the fruits of his mind and heart to the page. And this he does resoundingly. In John's poems, you'll find the sense of a thought springing to life, like the sudden appearance of birdsong at daybreak. The informal tone crafted by the subtlest of musical ears, and a clarity that creates a luminous atmosphere and otherworldly mystery. Naming of the Bones is another classic John F. Dean volume. In the book, we have poems about the creative process in nature and poetry itself. Poems about islands, poems about the mystery of Christ and presence of evil in the world. And in the final sequence, based on a piano suite by Olivier Messiaen, poems about music and eternity. Throughout the book, John addresses spiritual matters, but at the same time infuses the whole with such warm humanity that it glows like a street brazier for the sweet chestnuts. John's natural inclination is to quest like a pilgrim, but he never neglects the senses. One can find both angels and also boxy potato pancakes in John's poems. Similarly, he honors the great mystery of Christ in the world, yet never moves too far away from the messy business of everyday human life. And of course, everyday love, not least love for his wife Ursula and his children and grandchildren. Naming of the Bones is a marvelous book full of warmth wisdom and beauty, the perfect antidote for our dark times, and I may say the perfect Christmas present too. 
So that's uh, me for the moment. Um, I'm going to hand you over now to the main man himself, John F., who I hope will read a bevy of poems. Then he uh, and I will have a wee chat about them. And then I hope to twist his arm to read a couple more poems after that. Thank you. James, uh, that's a wonderful introduction. I am hum humbled and very grateful to you for your preparation of all of that. Um, and I also very much thank uh, Jasmine for all the work that she's done in setting up this Zoom launch and for Michael Schmidt and Karkinet for their fidelity and care with uh, my work down through the years. I have a series of poems from the book that I would like to read. And I had some introductions and things to each of them, but I'm going to skip most of the introduction because uh, James really has said it all. So a first uh, simple enough poem from a short sequence in the book. The sequence is called Send Word, and it's about uh, communication maybe between poet and reader, between poet and, and self. And it refers also to the, to the beauty of the world that I was brought up in and to the fact that I am not as young now as I used to be many years ago. The wild meadow is awash with a yellow spray of buttercups. Swallows that come swooping low over wind-blown grasses are sheer waters banking over life-giving waves. In the deep meadow, there are bubbles of lush white and purple clovers. The chick skylarks lurk like secrets not yet told. The roadside ditch in feisty commonness swells exotic. As if after all the years, they had forgotten how a life will drift past such familiar things. And now the wind set fair. I am an aging tar whose craft lies rigged and waiting in the harbor. It took some time to get the title for this collection, uh, Naming of the Bones. Um, but for me, always, naming is in fact uh, one of the most important things that we can come up with. So I have named in this several islands. I was born on an island, Achill Island, off the west coast of Mayo in Ireland. And um, I have been, I will say, in love with islands. Um, there is the wonderful John Donne uh, phrase, no man is an island separate unto itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. So even though the island is way off the west coast of Ireland, uh, it is still part of the universe. Um, I also think that every person, every man, every woman, is in fact an island because we have our own individual lives to live. Often the problem is to combine both being an island and being not an island. So the first poem from my island is a memory of when I was very young. And it's a poem I call The Humming Top. You know, the top that you used to have to squeeze up and down and then let it go and it would hum. Mother knelt by my crib and prayed, and I was forgiven the sins of the day. She blew out the flame, left me, and I was not scared of demon dreams or the dark. Crossing my arms over my breast, I remembered the spinning top left downstairs, how its pictures of horses and parrots and caravans blurred into yellows and reds. I slept, the spinning globe in my mind and all of the creatures. Though I knew how beautiful the world is, was aware that both child and adult weep sometimes, 
And though I saw how the white fronted geese labor through the ice green twilight and watched how the robin comes brazen to the garden seat, no one had given me the words. And because I sensed that the dream was me and not me, I cried too. I laughed and made signs, knowing already how the great world turns and spins, the colors fuse and the humming goes on and on. <coughs> Excuse me. The next island uh, to which I make pilgrimage uh, is an island called Inish Murray. It's off the coast of County Sligo under Ben Bulwan, which is Yates's uh, holy mountain, if you like. And it is also the place where Mount Batten uh, met his end, uh, was murdered by the IRA many years ago. Um, it is an island of pilgrimage in some sense. It's abandoned now. Um, it's very wild and very beautiful. <coughs> And it was one of the first places, I think, that the Vikings actually discovered and destroyed. So this poem is called Old Bones and begins with I, John. I was on the island called Inish Murray. There was a sense of genesis to it, alpha moment. Morning sun over the waters of Mullach Moor, boat engine idling, while we sat on fishing boxes and relished the yapping of waves against the hull. Ben Bulban in the distance, slopes of sun and shadow, sheltering Ireland's poet under her wings. The castle, Classy Bone, loomed as a dark landmark above the cliff. And we knew these waters brimmed not long ago with broken thwarts and exploded faith. For this is Ireland, holding her wars, her poets, her ruins and her reigns, and the holy islands where we, the curious, come to pray. Outside the harbour wall, we pitched in unexpected swell, Atlantic ocean spray blessing us with salt. Our touching on the island was uneasy, without dock or key, only the black rocks slippery with weed and sea wet. Herring gulls barked like guard dogs, and a kestrel, fast as a prayer, flew by. I scaled a rock trail through thistles where the testy ghosts wished to be left in peace. To this abandonment, friars came centuries after the Christ, to forge salvation, built rock altars, beehive cells, stone churches, piled up their cursing stones to keep women and fiends at bay. What is it then of sea and sky and island, of isolation and self-denial that has left its call in my flesh and soul that I come to scavenge here for understanding? The blackbacks watch, sharp-eyed and silent, shuffling on the dry stone walls like monks restless in choir. Within the ramparts of the enclosure, I sit lost and at home. Out on the headland, an old man plays off tune a slow lament on Riv to Egengarig, and the sea responds, a sigh and a withdrawal. There is one of the Irish saints uh, from my own part of Ireland, from Mayo, um, and his name was Saint Colmón. Uh, he was born and raised in the west of Ireland, and then, <coughs> to excuse me, then he left uh, for Iona, where he became a monk, and from there to Lindisfarne, and back to Iona, and then gathered several monks with him and returned to Mayo. And he founded a monastery on the island of Inish Boffin, another island that was um, invaded by 
the Vikings. It's a beautiful island, quite a touristy one nowadays, and it holds a very, very old, broken down church, which they say was St. Colmore's. So this is called the Rattle of Old Bones. The men were standing outside the church, hearing mass. Dark Sunday suits, flat caps and cautionary pipes. Serious men, one eye on weathers, one on neighbours, easing this hour between worlds, jocular, strong-jawed and firm-standing, like erratics. In St. Colman's ruined monastery, sheep safely graze. In waves offshore, the fishing boats chant in old Gaelic, time-worn sounds of the wild weltering sea. In deepest hour of night, the bones of monks slaughtered in the malevolent invasions of the Vikings set themselves to their eight-hand reels. There is joy through communion of saints out under the light of the moon, spine slides, skeletal slip jigs, the hysterical laughter of skulls. Woe is me, saith the book, for my soul hath fainted because of the saints that are slain. Lindisfarne, of course, is one of the most wonderful of the islands of pilgrimage, certainly, that I visited. And Coleman spent some time there. And after the uh, Whitby problems, when the Roman church decided when Easter should be, Coleman said, to hell with that, uh, I'm getting out of here. So he could not accept the Roman uh, Catholic domination. And he went back to Iona, gathered up the gang, and went back to Mayo, where he could have his own decisions. So this is uh, a poem called Coleman, Coleman on Lindisfarne. Tonight, the sea, out in the obdurate dark, shifts in obedience. The seals hauling themselves out onto the long shelf of sand in their own slick nudity, shifting too in a restlessness of seals, their plangent hymns to one another, carrying into the weave of human dreams and half-sleep, into the flesh of the long dead, floating in dust of the universe, in soul nakedness. We are young a while, and seek sanctuary, Lindisfarne, where saintly ghosts glide by, their voices distant as the loon's song out over the ocean, and close as the curlew's call purling from the fens. The North Sea's force spends itself in spume, and the herring boats lie safe above the tide line. I seek a haven that is not loneliness, but a table set with a white linen nap and laid for four. We will be old a time, allowed some scope, hold that the poems shaping themselves in the soul's sanctum may stay the waves a while as they call out to our God. Uh, I moved uh, further and further uh, in my search for islands and eventually the final one uh, in the series is actually the Book of Revelation one, Patmos. But on the way there, um, I came to Crete. Uh, as James Harper said in his generous introduction, one of my things that I did was to found a poetry press in Ireland, and I called it Daedalus. Uh, that was the James Joyce spelling of Daedalus, the wonderful father uh, of arts who made wings for himself and Icarus, where they could fly from their prison off the island and uh, into safety. 
Um, we spent some time on Crete on a holiday. And I really kept expecting, looking up the hills, expecting somebody to come flying over with the wings spread. So this is homage to Icarus. Young man of the Cretan uplands, downlands, of the labyrinthine runways of mountain villages, olive groves, goats, of the gaunt bell ringing sheep. He would fly as I would in the relish of bounteous grace. Whipped by the wind at first, as fear will fling you, then mastering it, the shoulder muscles jousting. Then it was the light blinding him as he topped Mount Ida and the White Mountains, the island below like rags and patches, clawed and torn, strewn about. When the blindness eased, he saw Daedalus, maker father, cautious on the updrafts beneath. But by now the sun was master, beyond fear, beyond vision, climbing on the up beam of the sky. Feathered arms spread, cruciform and soaring. So high he saw the earth revolving, and time itself like a vineyard, fruiting and dying back. So high at last, so cold, pain suffusing, he was suffering, punished for robbing the world of gravity, till what was glory froze in him, bones, sinews becoming iron, and he plummeted, bloodless, over the utmost horizons of our history. And there, I think I'll go back to James, if that's all right, and we can have a little talk before I come back to read the title poem of the book, if I may. James. Hello, John, again. Um, thank you so much for that wonderful reading. Um, ideally, I'd like to lie down in a darkened room and absorb those images and replay those musical rhythms, but it's my task to be chief interrogator. <laughs> thank uh, you. <laughs> I'd like to ask you a few things about sure. the book. Um, for example, the notion of inspiration and the place of Christ in your work. But before those two aspects, I'd like to ask you two other questions, if I may, and feel free to uh, not answer them. Um, in, in that poem you read, um, Old Bones in Ishmari, you say, quote, what is it then of sea and sky and island of isolation and self-denial that has left its call in my flesh and soul that I come to scavenge here for understanding? My question is, do you feel that your sensibility would have been different if you'd been raised in inland Mayo or in a big city? Did you, when growing up, feel insular and therefore keen to break out into a bigger world? Or did Ackle Island seem more like a, a haven or retreat from the noise of the world? In other words, how has Ackle Island shaped your poetic destiny? Um, it's, I, I would certainly be uh, sure that if I had lived in Dublin all my life or lived in a dry countryside, uh, everything would be different. I was once accused of writing about water and the leavings of water. And I think that's pretty true. I grew up completely um, conscious only of earthly things, of the absolute beauty of the island where I live, lived and grew up. Uh, my mind was not functioning other than on a sensual level. Uh, swimming, climbing mountains, the freedom of uh, an island where uh, there was no worry about leaving a bicycle, for instance, unlocked. You'd be certain it would be there when you get back. Um, my parents used to tell me on the summer day to go away after breakfast and come back for a rosary tonight. <laughs> and we were just let absolutely free. So the island 
entered my imagination and my soul without my being aware of it or conscious of it in any way. Um, at the same time, I was suffused by the Roman Catholic faith, um, which offered a different sense, if you like, when I grew up and realized it, of being island. Um, it was exclusive and excluding. And uh, I found it took me many, many years to uh, become permeable and to get out from under that um, sort of imprisonment of faith, to try and search for um, a gentler faith, uh, a possibility, without throwing out all the stuff of Catholicism or Christianity, in fact, to try and salvage what is beautiful and worthy in it. So I see my faith and my growing up on an island as nearly being now one and the same, growing from sheer physical awareness into some form of uh, intellectual consciousness later on, while at the same time realizing that what I had been brought up to believe as absolute and utter truths and not to be controverted or even uh, spoken about uh, in any negative way, uh, tied me down far too much to so the spirit wasn't free to, to roam. So I'm a slow developer, James, um, <laughs> but I intend to develop a little bit more in the time that is left to me. Um, very pleased to hear that, John. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you'll have many, many more years left, I'm sure. Um, Good. On, on a slightly different um, note, um, in that wonderful poem you read, The, the Humming Top, um, you mentioned seeing the geese and the robin and, quote, no one has given you the words. Mm. And you give the sense in the poem of a simple act of watching and being at one with the world. So my question is, do you sometimes feel that words get in the way of that sort of unity of being? Or do you feel that words are a conduit back to that humming top moment? Um, I would take the second uh, thing there. No, um, wherever it came from, no, I know where it came from. I have a, an absolute physical almost love of words. Um, and they, for me, they do not form any kind of blockage. I think it may go back to my father, our father, uh, my father in Ackle Island, who, because he was bored stiff with his life in an office, um, regaled himself with passionate music and passionate literature. And he found that kind of passionate literature, if you like, in uh, Russian and German romance novels and poetry, uh, from which he told us yarns and stories, often giving us, first of all, the phrase or the sentence in either Russian or German, which he taught himself, and then giving us the English for it. So I do remember things like re readings from Gogol, where the, the words like Tatar and Cossack became second nature to me instead of cowboys and Indians. Um, he invented names for of creatures that he pretended existed in the world around us. Like there was a Shosh Gillian uh, mm -hmm. who, and there was a Mrs. Duff, who was any little old lady wandering the roads. There was a person called Uchichila, who was outside in the coal house, and she was a teacher. So later on in life, I realized that Uchichila is exactly the Russian word for a teacher. So my love of language and my love of um, birds, bees, flowers, trees, everything, um, is combining with my love of actual individual words. Um, and I often analyze a word and it's, its meaning. Having the Gaelic, a certain amount of Gaelic as well at the same time, uh, forces me to take apart a word and see where it came from, why it is what it is and so on. So I, I, I do love words and they give me uh, freedom.
to to name things. I think it is terribly important to name things. Mm. Thank you. That was a, a very full answer. <laughs> uh, yes. Answer. <laughs> no, it was great. Um, so the, the two other main, well, not main questions, but two other questions for, the, for this segment um, concern uh, Christ. Um, in the Icarus poem, um, the figure of Icarus flying cruciform and for whom Daedalus is a maker father seems to merge him with Christ. And I don't know if that's a fair inter interpretation. And if so, perhaps you could say a few words about Icarus in this particular role and then move on to the, the role of Christ in your poem, since he seems to be in many ways the keystone figure mm. of the book into which the various parts interlock. Um, well, I, I suppose it, I do not want to see Icarus as Christ, um, but I do see Icarus as Christ. So I see the, the straining upwards the will to fly, the going beyond uh, what is actually uh, reasonable in life uh, is for me what, what Icarus really is all about. One of my great things in life would be to be able to fly. Now, when I was young, I used to leap off garden posts, getting, trying to get them higher and higher all the time to see if I could actually develop the muscles in the back of my shoulders into some form of wing and be able to fly. Um, I'm a Sagittarian and ah, the, uh -huh, well, you know about them, yeah. Uh, they're a bad lot. They are. Uh, they do uh, intend to fly higher than they are actually supposed to. And then their fall is, is great. So um, I am trying to fly higher than than I am capable of doing. So for me, Icarus, uh, it was obviously going to be a character of huge interest because of all of that. Um, the Christ figure for me is, is precisely the same. Um, the generosity of spirit, the, uh, I see Christ almost as a carefree character, reaching far beyond what uh, is reasonable for a human being to try and reach. And of course, the cruciform spread of wings uh, in Icarus uh, is what I, I, an intention to link, but at a great distance, uh, the Christ and the Icarus figure together. So it's bringing myth and Christianity maybe a little bit closer together in, in one sense. So I'm glad you spotted that little uh, <laughs> And uh, you can't get much past me, John, and you know that. I know that it's terrible difficult <laughs> to get around you. Um, so, so following on from that, um, from what you say, Christ is central to your poetic thinking, and I notice that you use Christ rather rather than Jesus mm. a lot. Whereas I suppose I would naturally tend to to use Jesus more than Christ, but that might be um, a side alley. Um, but Christ does seem to be your central muse in the same way that the Holy Spirit was Milton's muse. And the notion of Holy Spirit, of course, reminds one of breath. And the mm -hmm. Latin for breath is spiritus, uh, from which we get the word inspiration. Mm -hmm. So um, in a moment, I'd like you to read the title poem of your book, but perhaps you could say a few words about inspiration and your poetic process. Um, we have to come to a halt at around eight o'clock tonight and not eight o'clock tomorrow morning, James. Um, <laughs> well, just give me the one word answer then, and that would be fine. Yes. <laughs> um, what was the question again? <laughs> Um, I don't know where to start, literally, with that, I, except I do. Um, yeah. I'll come and back I to do. what I was saying already, that the Christian, the Catholic, Roman Catholic thing is a, is a binding sort of a faith. And therefore, it is a very limiting belief. Um, 
I, f I would find the Christ to be the very opposite of that. Uh, if, if you study Jesus and his words and his actions, there's nothing limiting or imprisoning uh, about him. Um, so I was brought up with a mind that was, in fact, impermeable. It, it would not allow the rain to come through. It bounced off me. Every, the world outside bounced off me because there are all these rules and regulations. Uh, so I was imposing myself, if you like, on the world around me when I started to try and write. I was expounding rather than uh, imagining or reading. So I have been trying to listen far more and to allow the words, the images themselves to take over rather than me impositioning, uh, put, imposing on them. And so this is uh, a part of what I try to do now is to let the words themselves dictate where the poem is going to go. And then let the poems themselves dictate to me where I am supposed to be going. I know it's kind of a half cliche to say that I don't know what I think until I read my own poems. But when I find, which is rare enough, that a poem actually does write itself, uh, obviously after a lot of preparation, then it is it surprises me and I do learn from it. So this inspiration, allowing, uh, in-breathing the world outside, allowing it in rather than imposing it, I see as an inspiration. That's a lovely answer, John. Thank you very much for that. Um, before I ask you to, <clears throat> if you will, read the extremely powerful title poem, <clears throat> are you going to read anything from um, the second section of the book, like like a dewfall, or or are you stopping with the title poem? Um, I thought I might just uh, because time is beginning to run out on us uh i will read what uh i will read the title poem which i think i should and would want to read and then i might i might just finish with the uh, last poem from the like the dewfall sequence and give a, a little okay. uh, word or two before that would that, that, would that be great. are you going to run those together um i'll mutter a little bit in between the, the two of them, just to, to break the, the sense sure. of the two very, very different poems and just Indeed. to allow one to uh, settle before I, I read the other one and that give some background to the Jufo. That sounds very good. Um, okay. Um, okay. Well, I, sh I shall look forward to hearing the, the title poem. Thank you. And um, yeah. Uh, this uh, is the title then, Naming of the Bones. Um, it comes from a funeral that I attended uh, and in June of 2017. And um, we, my Arthur and I drove down to a place in, in Bray, another, to a funeral of somebody. And uh, on the way down uh, on the radio, we heard the dreadful news of the Grenfell fire, the Grenfell towers and just could only imagine the distress and the pain and the suffering that was uh, had just happened. When we entered the church uh, for the funeral, I looked up and over the altar was this most extraordinary crucifixion, a crucifix up there, where the details of the body and its distortion and its obvious agony were strongly emphasized. It, it took me aback. And by the time I got home from the funeral, this poem had written itself almost um, because I, I was looking at the ribs of the body and thinking about the suffering that uh, Jesus must have undergone and saying, OK, uh, this is the central. If there is any form of answer, and I don't think there is, to uh, the giving to the actual suffering that we all go through, then this is the Christ, Jesus, is the central focus for that kind of suffering. Therefore, naming of the bones, uh, London, June 2017. And it's addressed, of course, to the Christ. I looked up and saw you, your distorted body, 
rising again in agony. There is a season, the big book says, a time to die, a time to weep, and a time for peace. No one, it says, can understand what is happening under the sun. I saw the bare breast heaving, that once beautiful breast. I hurt for you, for your beloved once beautiful body. Each twist or twitch, each reach and wrench adds to the fire in your flesh and in your bones. I plead to creator lover God for you, to ease your pain, to mother you. I wince once more at the bitter spittle angers of humankind, the blunted iron nails driven through your caring hands, your tender feet, so that impossible you hang from them and stand on them. The muscles cramp and spasm, and your face, so beautiful once, is contorted with spit and ugliness, with blood and sweat and tears. Today, my Christ, June 14, 2017, Grenfell Tower in London was engulfed in flames, inestimable furnace, suffering unbearable. A child appears for a moment at a window of the 16th floor, a moment only, frantic, waving. To a not there, Saviour, you? We hurt, my Christ, we hurt. Why is our spittle hot with bitterness? Words, the big book says, can be wearisome, a chastening after wind. And yet, the world breaks, the world reforms, but the beautiful body breaks and yields. Yearning and grief trouble us. At the heart of it, you hurting. It's a poem about uh, suffering. It's a poem that is placed more or less at the heart of the book, in the center of the book. And uh, a lot of the focus that I have on the presence of that wonderful human being, and I make no further claims for him here, that wonderful human being, Jesus, uh, suffered and showed us perhaps all how to do it. Um, I began the reading this evening with uh, a poem about being an aging tar, uh, my boat sailing close towards the harbour. Like the Dewfall is a sequence of poems, um, quite a lot of them, based on the music of Olivier Messiaen, who suffered in a Nazi uh, camp in Paris um, from, for quite a while. But while he was in there, he wrote uh, a, a piece called Vision de la Maine, Visions of the Amen. And it's a very complicated piece of music, seven movements in it for two pianos, two grand pianos. Very difficult to figure it out, uh, but very moving and very powerful music. So I, I focused on each individual piece, each seven pieces, seeing them as a men, as a way of accepting what life is offering us, a men to accept. Um, so the, the sequence, like the Jewfall, we live without noticing the steps that we take quite often. So we live like the Jewfall. Um, and this is the very last piece in the sequence. And I would like to read it because it is a softer, more gentle and uh, more optimistic piece of optimistic poem, which leads towards uh, the same end, which is death, I suppose, as the very first poem led to. So this one is set, in fact, in, in Dublin, uh, very far from the island where I was growing up. And it is the, the I character that tells the whole sequence of in the, like the Jewfall. 
and it hasn't a title in itself, but it begins day dying in the outer suburbs. Day dying in the outer suburbs, a quiet settling, unfussed, relishing alongside the woman he loves, boxy potato pancakes with parsley butter melting over, shrimp in garlic and lemon sizzling on the skillet, a pinot grigio, that honeysuckle flavour. Then stands outside in the warm dusk, faint sounds of distant traffic, scarcely a zephyr breath touching the high ash trees. The soft shudder of a boiler coming to life. Earlier, he had walked where Mallard and Waterhen had been busy about their mating rituals, their rushes and flurries across the waters of the canal stirred by original freshness and urgency. He inhaled luxuriously, knew that the people whom he loved were here, reveling everywhere around and waiting. Night closing in, soon raspberry and rhubarb crumble with a small dollop of cream, a film perhaps on the TV anticipating always the savoury heaviness of sleep. Brittle-hipped, a little arthritic and taut of hearing, climbing contentedly but cautiously upstairs. Amen, he says. Amen. O oh Christ, my Christ. Amen. Not a bad word to finish. Uh, a reading of poems on, I expect. So we come back to you, James. Yes, briefly, John, um, just to really say thank you so much for a marvellous reading of marvellous poems from a book full of marvels. Um, thank you, James. At a time when the world is um, full of gnashing of teeth for one reason or another, that it's wonderful to have an antidote um, in your book, Naming of the Bones. And I can't recommend it highly enough to anyone. Thank you, thank you. Tuning in, uh, it's a wonderful book. Um, so we, we have um, about six minutes left. Um, I think it's only fair to, to let your, um, your adoring public to ask a few questions. Uh, we probably <clears throat> won't get through them all, but um, uh, we might as well make a start and sure. see how far we get. Um, so I'm looking at the Q&A box from the bottom and um, DS Martin says, um, in your book, Give Dust a Tongue, do you speak of our worlds and our ages need, quote, to forge a poetry of personal encounter with Jesus. Mm. And he, D.S. Martin says he'd like to hear a bit more about this. Um, nice to hear from you, Don. Uh, hope you're, you're well. Um, I think that the poems that I have read this evening have already sort of uh, touched on um, my encounter with Jesus. Um, I did spend four and a half years uh, between my physical um, living of life and my coming into some form of consciousness, trying to be uh, a priest. I joined the Holy Ghost Fathers and spent four and a half years, as I now see it, in the Middle Ages, because we uh, kept silence. We uh, studied in Latin through the medium of Latin. We went to bed very early and we got up very early and I had a crucifix lying on my bed, on my pillow. Uh, and I was supposed to hold that to my chest all the time. I loved it. Uh, it was peaceful. We knew where we were going from minute to minute because we followed the bell. Um, so it was a period of 
about four and a half years where I very, very slowly came into the consciousness that I already uh, outlined in, in the reading. And of course, the central figure of all of that was Jesus. But I very quickly realized that the Jesus that uh, they were talking about was not the Jesus that I had been reading in the Gospels in the New Testament. There was none of, there was no church, there were no rules and regulations, there were no, you must do this or you must do that. Um, it was all love, uh, reaching out, healing. Um, and so very gradually, like the Jewfall, I realized that I was in the wrong place and tried to discover uh, who that lovely Jesus, in fact, is or was. So it's an ongoing encounter. Um, and I don't think I'll ever uh, get to the end of it. I don't want to get to the end of it because uh, if I do get to the end of it, I'll have to stop writing poems because I'll have it all figured out. And I don't think anybody can manage that. <laughs> Thanks for the question, Don. Thank you, Don. Um, I think we've got time for another one. The next one um, up is from Mary O'Donnell. And she says, how has your work changed and developed over the decades uh, in your view? Are you aware of a deepening focus on what seems to Mary to be the strongly spiritual yet earthy and raw? Um, I suppose uh, I have this notion that um, if you're writing something, you, you try not to repeat yourself. Uh, and I try all the time to move into different areas. So I read a great deal of poetry that that challenges me. Um, and, and there are quite a few contemporary poets that do that. And of course, there are some of the great older poets that do. I think what uh, if there is a development in it, Mary, it's because I tend now to see things not as in individual lyrics, but in uh, an overall view of things and an exploration that a lot of poems come together to explore a particular theme or subject. Um, and so I, I tend or try to tend to go deeper. And as I said before, I try and let uh, experience, the experience of living and the experience of reading and thinking uh, take me over rather than uh, me trying to take over and imposing my own um, view on things. So I'm listening far more, I think, than I used to do. Thanks, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Uh, for that question. Um, I'm conscious, John, that it's now by my computer 1959, and that's not the year, but the, the time. Yes. Um, so, are, so I'm, are, I'm, are you calling time, James? <laughs> time, time. Gentlemen, please. Um, yes. Well, I'm assuming that Jasmine will want to um, close things down at, uh, well, it is now eight o'clock, so I will just um, bow out by saying thank you so much John for your wonderful book, your wonderful reading, uh, your wonderful presence and witness and to wish you all the best with the book and uh, lovely to see you, I haven't actually seen you in the flesh True. In, in for True. two years or so. Yes, it's you're too looking, long James. Great. You're looking younger than, uh, than you were oh, yes. before. That's what's happening, yeah, I'm, I'm going backwards as usual. There's old bones. You're like Doctor Who. <laughs> They're yeah. rattling. The rattle of old bones. Thank you, John. I'll, James, I'll, thank I'll, you for your, your most generous uh, input and kindness. And pleasure. So, pleasure. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Uh, thank you both so much. Um, it's been a really pleasurable hour. So many people have also said in the chat, um, it's flown by and it's been a real, real honour to hear you guys talking about the poetry and the book and uh, to hear you reading John was just wonderful. So thank you so thank much you. and thank you guys for being here. Um, I'm putting the link um, to buy the book in the chat for you again. The discount code is there. Um, 
this might all be happening quite quickly. So don't worry about doing that now. You'll get an automatic email tomorrow with the code in so you can go and buy a copy of the book. Um, you can also buy one for all of your friends and family for Christmas, as James no very wisely pointed out earlier. Um, so please do that. Um, yeah, thank you for being here. Thank you for being so vocal in the chat as well and all your amazing questions. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, so all that remains to be said is please join us again. Um, this time next week, we are launching a new collection from Varni Kapildeo, uh, Like a Tree Walking. We're going to be launching that with Padre Bregan, um, who is a new uh, Northern Irish poet. We're bringing out their debut uh, early next year. So all the details for that are on the website. Please go and check it out and sign up to that. Um, so really, that's everything. I'm going to I'm going to close us all off now, but I'll leave the chat open for you guys for a few more minutes. So you can get your last messages in and you can access that link with the code. Um, but congratulations, John, um, and thank you guys for such a lovely evening.